Hello young people, this is Erin Jones. I am so excited to be joining you virtually this year. Um, excited that you are on this journey to activate yourselves as advocates and activists. You probably already know a little bit about me. Um, in case you don't, I have been working in education for 30 years now. Um, but I'm also the first black woman to run for statewide office. I ran to lead public schools in 2000, in 2016. Um, had I known how contentious that year was going to be, I may not have run for office, but I am, I don't regret it at all. Don't regret it at all. Learned so much. And so I think what I want to share with you today, I was able to share last year. Um, I just read a book. Y'all, in the middle of the pandemic, I read a book and I want to share a few strategies from this book that are really helping me move through this season. I'm not running for office, but I help people run for office. I was just in DC this week. Um, I help people think about how they talk to state legislators, how they talk to national lawmakers. So whatever arena you care about, I really believe these four strategies can help you move through the season as leaders and thinking about really being clear about your message, but also how do you develop the right attitude and posture to take as you're moving into conversations that are difficult? We are in the most difficult season of my lifetime. I'm 50, so I'm much older than all of you. Um, my children are probably all your age or older. My children may be older than you. Um, but it's something that we talk about a lot in our house and something that I am committed to practicing. So I want to share not the whole book, obviously, because I have 10 minutes, but I want to share four postures that I am really committed to making regular practices in my life. Um, I am a former ball player. I played basketball for 40 years. I played soccer for 20 years. So I am all about developing habits and behaviors. I know the power of habit of doing something so many times that it just becomes natural for you. And so I want to invite you to not just listen to these four postures that I'm going to share with you, but think about ways that you could practice these every day or at least five or six times a week. So posture one is gratitude. And that may sound fluffy and mushy, but here's the science behind gratitude. Gratitude is actually like a muscle. For a long time, I thought gratitude was something that some people just did naturally better than others. What I've learned, um, I want to give credit to my friend, Dr. Jenny Severson, who did her PhD on gratitude. Gratitude is like a muscle. So the more you practice gratitude, the more it becomes natural to be grateful. So it's not something that people are just naturally better at. There are some people that are more practiced at gratitude. But here's why practicing gratitude on a regular basis is really important. Gratitude actually changes your brain chemistry and it causes your neurons and dendrites to reform to create this positive neural network in your brain. I would offer for us that are leading, advocating, activating ourselves that we have got to start from a positive frame because there's so much negativity out in the world. It, it's easy to get discouraged, to feel overwhelmed. And so for me, the daily practice of gratitude is really important. So I want you to think right now about something you're grateful for. Man, I have so much to be grateful for right now, even though it's a really hard season. I just got to spend a week in D.C. with a former student who is now the teacher of the year for the state of Washington. I had her 23 years ago, and she became a teacher because I was her teacher. And then when she won the teacher of the year, she asked, would you come to D.C. with me? as my plus one for the events celebrating Teachers of the Year from around the country. So I just am coming back from a week-long trip to D.C. with my former student. So that's big gratitude today. Sometimes my gratitude is as simple as I woke up today. <laughs> like it's that simple. Doesn't have to be a big gratitude, but I want to encourage you, practice gratitude every single day. Find something to be grateful for. Either keep a gratitude journal or make sure you're sharing your gratitude with people every day. Posture number two, I want you to put your hands in front of the screen. Even though I'm not with you, I can see you because I'm a teacher. I got a third eye. I can see you. And I want you to picture in your hands what is something that you are really good at, something that you love doing. You don't have to be the best at it, but what's something you're good at? I want you to picture that in your hands. It may not be something in a job description. It may not be in your title. Okay, you can put your hands down. I know that one of mine is a smile. I love to smile. I love to smile. And being six feet tall with a giant afro terrifies people. I can see it as I'm walking through airports and 
uh, malls and spaces. I can see the terror in people's eyes at times. And so I wear clear masks because I know my smile disarms people. I know that's a gift that I bring. Another thing that's in my hands, I speak four languages. I'm able to connect with people from all over the world. In my Uber, my Uber drivers last week, one of them spoke Arabic. I speak enough Arabic to just say hello and thank you and all that. Um, I got to speak French last week. I got to speak Spanish last week. Those little connections will change how you're able to advocate. But guess what? Maybe you love to bake or draw. You're good with tech. All of those things can help as you do advocacy. There's nothing better than the person who brings baked goods to a rally, right? And so sometimes we dismiss those things as not important. I would argue that that's actually what makes us really powerful connectors. So what makes you a great advocate is sometimes the things that are not in a job description. So one, gratitude. Two, what are the assets you bring? Three, brave spaces. I think we've spent way too much time, especially in Washington state, being politically correct. And here's what that means. We've taught ourselves how to lie really well. We know how to say the right words, but there is nothing worse than watching someone use the right words, but I can see in their eyes and their body they don't believe those words. Let's stop that. In fact, let's stop playing it safe too. We can't afford to play it so safe right now. We need to be honest. And so I'm gonna invite you to something I call brave spaces. Brave spaces means creating the kind of environment wherever you are, where you can be your best and bravest self, where the people around you can be their best and bravest selves. And so the next time you go out to advocate, the next time you're with your team, I want you to ask one another, what do we need to be our best and bravest self? I'm gonna start by offering what I commit to myself. In my brave space, I am number one vulnerable. You know, there's nothing better than sharing stories with legislators and lawmakers and decision makers. They love a personal story. And so I share stories from my own life, stories of my own personal journey, stories of my children. Because I've done work in education for so long, I have a million stories of my own children, of students that I've taught. And so I open with vulnerable stories, stories that sometimes are hard to tell, stories of sometimes where I have failed and I've fallen short. Other stories where my children have been harmed by school spaces or I as an educator was harmed. I have to be willing to be vulnerable if I want people around me to be vulnerable. So I lead with vulnerability. Number two, I push through discomfort. I do not allow discomfort to stop me from moving through spaces. So about 90% of my work is talking about racial equity in all white spaces, oftentimes where people don't want to talk about equity. It's uncomfortable, y'all. Every single day, my work is uncomfortable. Doesn't stop me from doing it though. So I wanna invite you, embrace discomfort as an opportunity to stretch yourself. And then do not allow nor use shame, blame, and guilt. Shame, blame, and guilt may feel good to employ at times. They're not useful strategies in getting people to change their minds about things. They're not. They may change their mind in a heartbeat for you in that moment, but it's not a useful strategy to get someone to change long term. So I want to invite you to not use shame, blame, and guilt. And then when you make a mistake, which you're going to, here's how you respond in a brave space. I am sorry. Not, I'm sorry if I offended you. Not, girl, you're taking me too seriously. Why are you taking that? I didn't mean it that way. No, I am sorry. And then have grace for yourself. When you mess up, have grace for yourself. Choose to grow. Say you're sorry. Choose to grow and be different next time, but don't hold on to that forever because that will paralyze you. Last thing, get curious about people who believe, who vote, who behave in ways that are totally different from you. Get curious. When you see that post by someone, that tweet by someone, when you hear that comment, instead of saying, oh my gosh, you suck. <laughs> instead, wait, can you help me understand how you came to believe that thing? Can you help me how, how you help me understand how you, why you vote that way, why you voted for that particular thing? I, I don't understand and I really want to understand. That's hard, y'all. It's hard. But I want you to commit to being curious. So one, gratitude. Two, what's in your hands? Three, brave spaces. What does it take to be your best and bravest self? Last one. And we're not going to actually practice this, but I want to encourage you to do this. It's called grounding in. 
I want to encourage you as you're walking into meetings that you know are going to be tough. When you feel your emotions getting the best of you, when you're tired or frustrated or hungry, instead of angry typing to correct that person or word vomiting all over someone, I want to invite you to just stop. Close your eyes and deeply breathe for 10 seconds or 20 seconds. Check in with yourself. Stop what you're doing and just get grounded. I promise you, if every president and every leader just paused before they responded, our conversations would be so much different. So guess what? You modeled that yourself. So again, back to the beginning. One, gratitude. Practice it every single day, even if it's just a little thing. Two, what's in your hand? What is it that you're bringing to the table today? Three, what do you need to be your best and bravest self? Four, just pause and ground in. Take care, y'all. Go and change the world.